the times that I've been through. Father, I place into your hands the way that I should go. For I know I always can trust you. Father, I place into your hands my friends and family. Father, I place into your hands the things that trouble me. Father, I place into your hands the person I would be. For I know I always can trust you. Seek your face, we love to hear your voice. Father, we love to sing your praise and in your name rejoice. Father, we love to walk with you and in your presence rest, for we know we always can trust you. Father, I want to be with you and do the things you do. Father, I want to speak the words that you are speaking to. Father, I want to love the ones that you will draw to you. For I know that I am. Good morning everybody, now you've got the sound. Uh, this morning we are streaming live and having our service in church as well. And we're going to be doing some climbers and explorers with our children, so that's very exciting, isn't it? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. thank you, it is, yes. So welcome, whether you are in church or whether you are at home, uh, whether you are at work or whatever you might be doing today. Welcome as we gather together to worship God together. Um, as we go through our service, it will be on the screen and, um, and on the television, wherever you might be. And so as we do that, let's just pray and let's thank God for what we say. So loving God, we thank you. We thank you for today and for opportunity to come together, wherever we might be, to worship you. And as we come together, would you speak to our hearts this morning and may we get to know you a little bit more in our lives. Amen. Amen. So we're going to pray together as we start our service. We come from scattered lives to meet with God. So let us recognise his presence with us. As God's people, we have gathered let us worship him together. So we're going to sing, well, some of us might be singing at home, and we're going to come along and get our instruments out. So we have got some instruments on our tables, so we're going to play our instruments. So I apologise if we can't hear anything online. We're just going to have some fun.
lesson is taken from 1 Kings chapter 3 starting at verse 4 and the most important of these altars was at Gibeon. So the king went there and sacrificed 1,000 burnt offerings. That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and God said, what do you want? Ask and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, you were wonderfully kind to my father David because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued this great kindness to him today by giving him a son to succeed him. O oh Lord my God, now you have made me king instead of my father David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am among your chosen people, a nation so great they are too numerous to count. Give me an understanding mind, so that I can tell the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great nation of yours? The Lord was pleased with Solomon's reply, and was glad that he had asked for wisdom. So God replied, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people, and not asked for long life or riches for yourself, or the death of your enemies. I will give you what you've asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding mind, such as no one else has ever had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you have not asked for, riches and honour. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon woke up and realised it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Lord's Covenant, where he sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. Then he invited all his officials to a great banquet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Hebrews, and the writer, right at the end of the book of Hebrews, says this. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. And so this morning, um, there's a guy called Craig who works for the diocese and talks of, helps people to do understand their calling and to come and do all sorts of things like that. Anyway, he can't be here this morning, so he's made a little video for us of the talk. Well, good morning. It's really great uh, to have been invited back um, to preach at St. Wilfred's, um, a huge privilege. Um, even if uh, because of the pandemic, it means um, that I haven't actually been able to come and uh, meet you and see um, what uh, St. Wilfred's looks like and what the people of God uh, in Calverton are up to. Uh, Sam's asked me to uh, speak this morning on uh, this dream from uh, Solomon um, that he has um, and uh, I want to start off by telling you a story um, of where God, uh, I think, helped me to step out uh, in boldness into my calling. Um, it's quite an embarrassing story, and it's a story about going to the barbers, and I hate 
going to the barbers. I still haven't managed to get there. I'm booked in um, later this week. So by the time you see this, uh, all of these uh, long uh, bits of hair will have gone, I hope. Um, but I hate, I hate um, having my hair cut. Um, and uh, so um, I found a barber's um, when I was in Canterbury um, uh, uh, serving there uh, that I uh, kind of it was all right. There was a bit of awkward small talk, but not too much. Um, and if it was in silence, um, that was OK. Um, but when you're um, a, a vicar um, in your late 20s um, uh, and, and 30s, um, it's uh, quite an interesting thing for people to talk to you about. Um, so you'd be sat, I'd be sat in the barber's chair with this guy and uh, he'd, he'd say, oh, so what do you do? Oh, I'm a vicar. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Um, oh, yeah, I've, um, uh, are you at that church um, uh, just up the road? Uh, yeah, not, not the big one in the middle, that's the cathedral, but uh, yeah, just up past the police station. Oh, oh yeah, um, oh, I've cut some of the Archbishop of Canterbury's hair before. We didn't believe he was actually going to turn up. We thought it was a prank. Um, and, uh, and that canon um, Nick uh, Papadopoulos um, uh, at the cathedral as well, he's been in. Um, oh, it must be wedding season, is it? It was always um, the kind of go-to line. Um, and uh, it was the middle of November. I'd already told him loads of times uh, that our church didn't do many weddings because it was a 1960s brick building and it was yellow inside, which most brides didn't think went well with their dresses. Anyway, that's my normal experience. But I went to a new barber's um, uh, once, um, just as the church was beginning to look at a series thinking about being fruitful on our front lines of stepping out and sharing um, the love of God in the places that they found themselves day to day. Uh, so uh, this uh, new barber said, oh, so what do you do? Making that kind of small talk. I said, oh, well, um, I'm a vicar. All oh, right, that's really interesting. Uh, why do you do that? I thought, ah, I've got him. Uh, this is a great opportunity. And so I told him about how I'd met Jesus as a, a university student. And I told him about how it, gave, it had transformed my life. And I'm passionate about other people having the opportunity uh, to, to, to do that um, and to, have their, to encounter uh, the risen Jesus. And he looked at me in the mirror and he said, ah, oh, that's a good answer. Ah, I'd been bold, I'd been confident, um, but I didn't quite have that in mind uh, when he responded and just said, that's a good answer. So we sat in awkward silence for the rest of the haircut. So as we continue looking through your series this morning on prayer, um, this morning we're looking at this vision that Solomon has in a dream, a dream where he prays for wisdom to God to fulfil his calling in boldness and honouring God. Solomon finds himself going to Gibeon, uh, which is about six miles north of Jerusalem, to offer his worship uh, the passage tells us this was a regular practice of the king and he had burnt thousands of offerings there. And this time when he goes, he encounters the Lord. He appears to him in a dream by night. And what is the thing that God says to Solomon? God says to him, ask what I shall give you. The Lord Almighty, the King of Kings, the great God of heaven. The one who brought the people out of Israel, out of, of Israel, out of captivity in Egypt. The one who provided them for them in their own, them with their own land. Who rooted their enemies before them. Who chose David and his family line. Comes to Solomon in a dream and asks him what he wants. Now, if you're a king at that time, you have absolute power. You don't have governments or ju judicial systems to hold you to account. You have absolute wealth and absolute power over others. You can do what you want to do. So how does Solomon respond when the Lord says to him, ask what I shall give you? He responds in thanksgiving. He declares God's faithfulness to his father, David. He plays down the power that he has when he stands in the presence of Almighty God in this dream. He talks about himself being simply a child when by this point in his life, we know he's at least got one of his own children. So he's no longer a child. What does a king need at a time of peace and prosperity for Israel? More troops, bigger chariots, more land, more riches? Well, maybe. But Solomon asks for wisdom. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? 
who is able to do the job of governing and being a king, except with the help of God. That is Solomon's calling. And he says, God, this is what I need to fulfill my calling. He needs wisdom. And we know some of the stories of uh, his wisdom and the outcomes, don't we? Whether it was uh, the prostitute and her child, whose life um, Solomon saves by his wisdom. Uh, whether it was um, the fact that his wisdom and his great wealth um, led to Israel being at its greatest. And with the Queen of Sheba travelling to come and meet this great, wise king. It is a bold, yet a servant-like request. Solomon wants to fulfil this calling as king effectively. And so this is what he asks. And in Matthew 7 and Luke 11, in the Sermon on the Mount, we have our own Lord Jesus offering us the same thing. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. But Jesus says to us, ask and I will give it to you. And if it's in line with his will, if we've sought him and we're longing to fulfil what he, we feel he's called us to, then he will provide for us. So what does this mean for us? Well, the first thing I think it means is that we have to give thanks for all that God has given us. We need to be seeking first his kingdom. Um, as I've already noted, Solomon's response to God's question is to give thanks for God's faithfulness. He reminds himself of where he is and how he was placed there as king. As Jesus says to us, ask and it will be given. He does this in the context of that teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew 6, just before, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Uh, he has said, seek first the kingdom of God. And so if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, seeking his will, his presence, his action in your life and in the lives of those around you, then what we ask for will be given. He will equip us for where he's called us to be. And so as we respond um, as disciples, as we offer our lives, we need to give thanks for who God is, to remember who he is and whose we are. And I think that's what I spoke on last time briefly when I uh, preached via video to you. Um, but we need to remind ourselves of what he has done for us, the big things and the little things. And that thanksgiving can be really important, particularly in the midst of this uh, pandemic uh, that we all find ourselves in. Uh, the second thing is to, that we need to remember that the gifts God has given us are offered in service. This uh, Solomon uses the language of your people, Israel. These are the king's people. Um, Solomon is the king of Israel. They are his subjects. And yet he asks for these gifts of wisdom and discernment to help govern your great people, he says to God. He asks the question out of a desire to fulfil his calling. And he always reminds himself that it, really these are God's people. And he has been called as vice regent for God. Um, and God is the true king and leader of Israel. When Solomon dedicates the temple in uh, 1 Kings 8, uh, he uses the phrase your people Israel seven times in 22 verses. He knows that he is just standing in as a human representative for God. And so if we look at Jesus again, we see the perfection of his humanity. His leadership and ministry is all about service. It's all about serving others. However, people come to him, remembering that each of them, from the youngest child that he raised from the dead, from the woman with the bleeding that wouldn't stop, who interrupted his journey to heal someone else, whether it was the outcast prostitute who perfumed his feet, each was a gift from God that he could serve. And I remember in my last church, um, the children's worker uh, used to go into the local primary school. It wasn't a Church of England primary school, but she used to go in, she was invited in. And every time, every week she went in, she took in uh, two large tray baked cakes covered in icing and hundreds and thousands to bless the staff uh, in this school. And that built her reputation, that gave her opportunities for conversations in the staff room. It gave her goodwill of that school so that she could go in and run uh, events telling them about the Easter story, about the Christmas story, so that she could share the good news of Jesus Christ in that place. So the third thing then I think we see in this story is that we need to be bold to step out and ask God 
so that we can fulfill who he's called us to be. So where does that leave us this morning? Well, each of us is wonderfully and uniquely made. Each of us will have different places where we encounter other people at work, at the school gate, in the supermarket, on our streets, at sports clubs or other activity clubs. What do we need? What do you need to be of service, to be interested, to take the time to encounter those in your daily life? Some of us might need extra patience for a particularly tricky work colleague or a particularly difficult pupil in one of our classes. You may be aware of a difficult or unjust situation where you need boldness to step in and challenge management or leaders of an institution in an appropriate way. You may need strength simply to get through your day again, to care for those around you that have been entrusted to you. Sam asked me in speaking this morning to encourage you to be bold in your faith, to take a lead from Solomon's prayer and ask God to equip you. And I wonder what questions or fears you have about sharing your faith and being known as a Christian, of stepping into that calling of being a disciple. What do you need God to do for you this morning? What do you need in gifts, in patience, in character. Society and the culture around us love hearing stories. We each have our own story and it is a unique story to us. People love hearing it. And the Archbishop's Lent book um, just before Easter was written by an old friend of mine, uh, Hannah Steele. And she talks about how people are ready to share stories, to hear our story, to share their story. People are no longer asking the questions that lead us to share the gospel in four steps. Creation, sin, death, resurrection, however you've learnt that story. But they are fascinated to know what a difference Jesus makes to your life. What a difference being a Christian means in your day-to-day living. And and there was some research done in 2015, it's getting a bit old now, Um, but it was called Talking Jesus. And it suggested that one in five of our friends, family and colleagues actively want to have a conversation with Jesus. They just don't know who to talk to. Now, I'm really challenged by that because I think, am I bold enough to talk about Jesus in my everyday life? And I'm a minister of the Church of England, a full-time minister. Am I bold enough to have that conversation, to to take the risk of being, (coughs) to take the risk uh, of being rejected a few times for that one conversation in five that might just lead to somebody learning more and experiencing the presence of God. What an encouragement that is for each of us. What about when you go to work tomorrow or to the school gate and somebody says, how was your weekend? Oh, well, it was great. And we had this amazing preacher come in via video. He pre-filmed. It's great doing church online. Oh, really? I didn't know you went to church. And you could have a conversation like that. Let me tell you about my story because this is the most important thing to me. When we deal with people, we need to show them that we care, that they are genuinely important. We need to dare to speak out to them. We need to share something of our story and we need to make sure we continue to be praying for them. So in conclusion, we've seen this morning the story of Solomon asking for a gift at God's request. He asked boldly for that gift of wisdom and discernment to fulfill his calling. And as we look at our life, our calling, we need to remember that we should give thanks, that we should always use our gifts to serve others, and that we need to be bold in asking. Remember, we have a good heavenly father who longs to give good gifts to his people. What do you need? to step out this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love for us and I thank you for the great gifts you have on offer to us. And I pray this morning for each of us, for all of us at St Wilfred's listening and gathered to worship. Lord, I pray that you would equip us, give us boldness and confidence to lead us into our discipleship, to take those opportunities to share our faith and know that the most important thing is how you view us. 
So give us wisdom and discernment as we seek the gifts that we need in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Really great um, to be with you this morning. Um, God bless you. And I hope to be able to come in person at some point. Bye-bye.
that we may support, encourage and bring hope to those who are weary and fearful as we emerge more from the COVID lockdown. We remember that your word says, perfect love casts out fear. Let your love shine through us. We pray for those who are ill, alone or vulnerable, that they would know the power of your healing presence and comfort each day. May they rest and wait upon you as you renew them with your strength and hope. Lord, help us to wait on you and renew our strength. We pray for our world. Lord, as we wait upon you, we hold up to you the places in the world where there is great suffering because of war, famine, and the COVID epidemic. We think of those especially in India struggling with the overwhelming effects of the COVID-19. We think of those in Yemen devastated by war and famine. And we think of those in Israel who are mourning the loss of their loved ones lost in the tragedy at the festival this week. We pray for those who follow your calling to share the good news of Jesus as they care and support the vulnerable, sick and needy in these difficult situations. Give them protection, strength and resilience in the challenges they face. Raise up those with righteous voices that call out and are heard so that governments and authorities will act justly and have mercy. Give leaders your wisdom in seeking reconciliation and bringing sustainable peace. Give our rich nations the will to be compassionate and generous, providing resources and solutions that are fair and helpful. And Holy Spirit, give us passion and insight in what to pray for our world knowing that our prayers will be heard. Help us to be persistent in prayer for the suffering, forgotten and lost. Lord, help us to wait on you and renew our strength. We pray for the church. We pray for the universal church that we will be faithful in our calling to Jesus Christ. Help church fellowships from different denominations to seek and find ways to work together in unity and peace to bring in your kingdom. May your church always seek and be inclusive of all generations and all peoples. May we be mindful that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made, created in your image. Help us to value and respect the gifts each individual has to offer. Let us be a glorious celebration of unity in diversity. We pray especially for those churches who are following your calling to bring your message of love in countries which are hostile. Countries such as North Korea, Afghanistan, Libya and many others. Give Christians there your peace and protection as they live out their lives under immense pressure. Thank you for the work of Christian charities such as Open Doors who raise awareness and campaign on behalf of our persecuted brothers and sisters. Lord, help us to wait on you and renew our strength. Psalm 27, Elaine, Elaine, sorry, Psalm 27, 8, verse 8 says, 
My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. We pray that each of us will hear and listen to God's call to grow in relationship with him. To respond to the call of Jesus to follow him wholeheartedly. To be sensitive to the presence of your Holy Spirit, leading and directing us in a calling which may be in the home, caring for our children or other family members, or in the workplace, and in church. May we use the gifts that you have given us, given us within our church family. May we learn to live, move, and have our being to bring about your will, God, for your praise and glory. We pray for your kingdom to come as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
So Lord, I thank you for time together. Thank you that we can come to worship you. That we can bring our lives and you are faithful to us. Amen. Um, so a couple of things to say. The notices uh, on Tuesday um, we are starting Little Wolf's back up. So a bit of prayer for that would be great. And then on Wednesday we've got our um, prayer time of prayer, midweek prayer at 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning. And on Thursday it's Living with Lost Cafe. So this week uh, we've kind of been a bit open. And so, um, so just to bear in mind and pray for the safety and everything else as we gradually open up our building and do stuff together. Next Saturday it is... Messy Church. Messy Church! So Messy Church next Saturday in uh, the Vicarage Garden, bring a picnic, we'll all get some chips. Don't mind which. And uh, we're going to have a gospel in the messy church in the garden, hopefully. So we we'll just pray that it doesn't rain. So that otherwise, we'll be back in here. Uh, so there we go. Some things that are happening over this next week. So let's pray our last final prayer together. Now, I was hoping that the children might have finished what they were doing outside to come and show us. But they're still outside, so they won't be able to show us. Well, they'll be able to show us, but they won't be able to show you. Put a picture of um, so anyway, let's pray our final prayer together. God of power, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit equip us to love and love you now and always. Amen.